A long, simmering power struggle boiled over on February 24, 2020, when Dr. Mahathir Mohamad unexpectedly announced his resignation as Malaysia's Prime Minister. His decision prompted members of Parti Pribumi Bersatu Malaysia, or Bersatu, to pull out of the ruling Pakatan Harapan coalition en masse, along with nearly a dozen members of Parti Keadilan Rakyat, or PKR. The mass exodus led to the collapse of the two-year-old government under the weight of internal rivalries and plunged the country into a deep political turmoil. Within a matter of days, uh, the political crisis broke out. We have Pakatan Harapan split. Rival political parties then scrambled to strike deals among themselves, hoping to secure the support of at least 112 MPs out of the 220 parliamentary seats required for a simple majority to form the next government. The renegade party, Bursatu, decided to drop Dr. Mahathir as its candidate for Prime Minister and threw its support behind party president Muhyiddin Yassin. The decision was backed by two former political rivals, the United Malays National Organization, or UMNO, and the Islamic party, Baas. So that in itself, you see, is an indication that Mahathir is really not in control, despite the aura of him you see, being the centre of it all. The political storm ended with the King's appointment of Mr. Muhyiddin Yassin as the country's eighth Prime Minister on Sunday, March the 1st, 2020. But who's really responsible for the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government just two years after its historic victory in the 14th general election? Was it Muhyiddin Yassin? Or was it PKR's former deputy president, Azmin Ali? Or is the downfall a result of Dr. Mahathir's own undoing? And with the appointment of Mr. Muhyiddin as prime minister, will it herald the return of Malay nationalist politics, putting an end to the reformist agenda and the new Malaysia dream? On March the 1st, 2020, President of Bursatu, Muhyiddin Yassin, was sworn in as Malaysia's eighth Prime Minister. The event capped a week of political turmoil and dramatic roller coaster twists that began with the resignation of former Prime Minister and leader of the Pakatan Harapan Coalition, Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. His surprise decision was initially aimed at consolidating his position amidst all the political infightings both within and across party divisions. But that attempt triggered his own political downfall after he was ousted by Mr. Mohidin, a one-time ally who has now been accused of plotting to take over the premiership. How did it all happen? It was towards the end of a normal work week. A number of parties were holding their annual meetings. On Friday, February the 21st, 2020, the ruling Pakatan Harapan Coalition held a rare meeting. It was in an apparent attempt to try and force Dr. Mahathir Mohamad to set an exact date to hand over power to Prime Minister-in-waiting Anwar Ibrahim. On Saturday, February the 22nd, UMNO and PAS also began their two-day inaugural retreat. But the next day, Sunday, February the 23rd, PKR Deputy President Azmin Ali and his supporters held a meeting at Sheraton Hotel in Pataling Jaya. By then, it was becoming increasingly clear that something was amiss. Anwar's supporters, I think, became very impatient and it sort of led to the rift and it became worse and worse and worse. And so you have, uh, an, uh, in the meantime, Azmin thinking that he's got uh, such a powerful you know, power base, very close to the Prime Minister. So I would, I would really kind of pin it down to the deep rivalry between Azmin and Anwar. At 9am on Sunday, 
Prime Minister Mahathir's party, Bursatu, held a separate six-hour-long meeting. Top of the agenda was an attempt by Dr. Mahathir's core supporters to convince the Prime Minister to leave the Pakatan Harapan coalition and form a unity government, which would include former rivals Amno and Pass. Despite their best effort, they were not able to convince Dr. Mahathir to leave the ruling coalition. Dr. Mahathir reiterated that he was not prepared to accept UMNO members en bloc. Publicly, I think Mahathir has been very consistent that he is not willing to work with uh, kleptocrats. Uh, I think this has got to do with the 1MDB issue, the corruption issue, and his mission in the 2018 elections is to clean up the government. I think his, his message has been very consistent uh, on the surface. A string of secret meetings soon gathered pace. And that included a meeting on Sunday, February the 23rd, at the Sheraton Hotel, involving leaders of Barisan Nacional, Versatu, Bas, and a splinter faction of PKR led by Mr. Asmin. The so-called Sheraton Move plotted to topple the Pakatan government and replace it with a new coalition named Perikatan Nacional, or National Alliance comprising AMNO, PAS, Versatu, MCA, MIC, and some PKR defectors. Soon after, on Monday, February 24th, everything began to crumble. 11 PKR members, including Mr. Asmin, left their party PKR and the Pakatan Harapan coalition. The majority of MPs from Dr. Mahathir's party Bursatu also abandoned the coalition. Around noon the same day, Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad announced his resignation. Pakatan Harapan lost the minimum 112 MPs needed to govern the country. It also lost its leader and prime minister, and that led to the collapse of the coalition. Even, I think, weeks before that was going to happen, people already anticipated that there could be some moves, that that was that, that if Anwar's camp uh, refused to accept Mahade staying on, then they would just um, have this fallback plan, you see getting out of Pakatan and joining forces with the BN and all the other parties. There was a Pakatan Harapan Leadership Council meeting uh, on Friday night, uh, 21st February, and uh, publicly Pakatan Harapan leaders were showing full support to Mahathir to the extent saying that Mahathir has his time, he can resign at any time, and uh, the, the, the deadline that we are hearing is that it's after the APEC summit, which is sometime in November. But within a matter of days, uh, the political crisis broke out. We have Pakatan Harapan split. Uh, Basatu left Pakatan Harapan, and some of PKR members left uh, the party. It led to the collapse of Pakatan Harapan. In the ensuing chaos, political pundits were struggling to make sense of the political mayhem. At one point in time, there was speculation that this political manoeuvre was the brainchild of Dr. Mahathir Mohamad to stop Anwar from becoming the next Prime Minister. But such a theory was debunked even by Mr. Anwar himself. No, I think it is not him because his name was used. Uh, those within my party and outside, we have been, you know, using his name and he said he, need, he reiterated what he had said to me earlier he played no part in it he made very clear that in no way will he ever work with those um, uh, associated with the past regime and we already heard these rumors but then following uh, day and after that so on a sunday uh, we saw several political leaders from amno from pas uh, Azmin Ali was there, and even uh, Muhyiddin Yassin, you know, the, the, the president of Basatu, uh, coming together, which uh, affirms uh, the rumour earlier that there might be uh, a Malay unity government, which is uh, an alternative to Pakatan Harapan. After his shock resignation, Dr Mahathir was installed as the interim prime minister by the Malaysian king. While many rival parties rushed to strike deals and consolidate their positions, 
Dr. Mahathir mooted the idea of a national unity government, a grand coalition that would bring together political parties across the political divide. He gives the image that he's not interested in party politicking. I mean, that's what he reiterated in his uh, address to the nation. Uh, and hence, he's leaving the party politicking to the other people, but he uh, holds that higher ground saying that I'm in charge of this country and I'm interested to tackle the country's problems. But his idea of a unity government was turned down by leaders of the rival parties. Pakatan component parties balked at the idea of joining a unity government with AMNO and PAS in it, and vice versa. AMNO and PAS making it uh, very clear, not only obviously that they, they don't want to have anything to do uh, with um, uh, Pakatan, but also in the context of Dr. Mahathir's uh, idea of a, initial idea of a unity government that they didn't want to have it, they didn't want to have anything to do with that, on the assumption that it might include uh, having to work with the DAP. So, in other words, the, these old uh, issues, these old wounds uh, that had never been, you know, were never healed in the first place, um, uh, festers again, uh, breaks open again. Um, and impinges on uh, Malaysia and the future of Malaysia again. At the end, Dr Mahathir was sidelined by his own party, Bersatu, and some members of PKR. Even the two formidable parties, AMNO and PAS, pulled back their support for Dr Mahathir and endorsed Mr Muhyiddin as the prime ministerial candidate for the newly minted coalition, Prikata Nasional, or National Alliance. That came after the Malaysian king decided to let party leaders nominate their prime ministerial candidates, maintaining that a candidate who enjoyed the majority support of lawmakers would be the country's next prime minister. The decision went against Dr Mahathir's earlier call for a vote in parliament to elect a new leader. After interviewing 222 members of parliament, the king, then exercised his constitutional powers by naming Mr Muhyiddin as the next Prime Minister, whom he believed had won the majority supports of the lawmakers. Dr Mahathir was left out in the cold. It also brought an end to the two-year leadership of Pakatan Harapan government, which many say was like a disaster waiting to happen due to the dwindling support from the electorate. Well, um we can expect that the amount, level of support uh, given to Pakatan Harapan um, based on uh, the by-elections results in 2019 and in 2020 that the Pakatan Harapan has not been able to win uh, by-elections. And um, the straw that broke the camel's back was the Tanjung PI by-elections in Johor, which saw Pakatan Harapan loss significantly. Uh, which is an important state. Uh, Johor is an important state for AMNO and for the state for Bersatu. So based on that support and the discourse and the policies, uh, we can see that um, uh, Pakatan Harapan was beginning to be more unpopular. Uh, they have not been able to address the socio-economic problems of the country. They have not been able to uh, fulfill their promises. People had a lot of really, you know, very high expectations of the government and the amount of reform that could be uh, implemented very quickly. Um, but of course, reform takes time and moving from, you know, a 61-year-old system of government, including the civil service and all the rest, to a new system takes time. But certainly, I think that they, they were not aided by their very ambitious manifesto that had been, you know, put together really perhaps not anticipating that they would have to move quite quickly to try and implement some of these things. Still, the fall of Pakatan Harapan government does not go down well with many Malaysians like Shankar Santiram. Until today, the 49-year-old management consultant finds it hard to accept the fact a decision made by millions of voters at the last general election could be overturned by a group of MPs just overnight. It was very difficult for me as a voter to understand, as a Malaysian to understand, how the will of the people is so blatantly pushed aside by just a handful of members of parliament, about 25, 30 members of parliament. 
20 from Basatu and about 10, 11 from uh, uh, the renegade branch of PKR. Um, how these 30 people single-handedly made a decision on behalf of 32 million people, uh, it's not the voting population, but we have 32 million people here, that, you know what, we're going to switch halfway through a game. It's like, you know, wearing one particular jersey in a football match, and then suddenly, randomly, three or four players decide they're going to change jerseys and go to the other side. So it's very, very, you know, it's uh, annoying. But who really were the brains behind the plot that finally toppled the Pakatan Harapan government? What do they have to gain in the process? Dr. Mahathir's resignation as Prime Minister came against the backdrop of a growing unhappiness among Malaysians with the Pakatan Harapan government after a series of failed promises. And that was affirmed in the latest Merdeka Centre survey in January, which saw a drop in support for Pakatan Harapan government among Malay and Chinese voters. The non-Malays felt shortchanged due to the government's failure to fully realise its reform agenda. The Malays, on the other hand, were worried that their special rights and privileges would be eroded under Pakatan government's leadership. They had also accused DAP of manipulating the government from within. Pakatan, I think, clearly faced some serious challenges. In part, due to the uh, inexperience of some of the leaders that have been put in place, uh, they, I think, have trouble trying to translate uh, the vision and the policies they had in mind into policies that need to be implemented by the various government agencies that they were leading. Second, uh, the opposition began to consolidate uh, and this increased friction towards Pakatan Harapan and the opposition comprising AMNO and PAS was able to mobilise large support largely on sectarian and communal basis um, that basically thwarted uh, Harapan's uh, attempts to introduce some reforms. And I think as uh, time wore on, uh, a lot of the high expectations gave way to despair. Former cabinet minister and member of DAP, Zai Ibrahim, feels that the Pakatan had done little to allay the fears, especially among large segments of Malay voters. And that has allowed both AMNO and PAS to capitalize on his weakness and reap full advantage of the situation. AMNO and PAS, after the loss, 2018. The quite on a new uh, narrative for the country, you know, especially addressing the, the Malays and the Muslims, that we have to be together, otherwise we'll lose everything. The Chinese will take over, the AP will take over. It's a, it's a very uh, dangerous kind of politics. What has made matters worse was the state of the Malaysian economy. The country recorded its lowest growth in 10 years during Pakistan's leadership. It posted GDP growth of 4.3% last year, compared to 4.7% the year before. But the real issue that broke the camel's back was the series of by-election defeats suffered by Pakatan Harapan candidates. Since January 2019, Pakatan Harapan lost five by-elections, including Cameron Highlands, Semenye, Rantau, Tanjong Pi, and Kimanis. Bersatu's massive electoral defeat in the Tanjong Pi by-election to a Barisa Nasional candidate was particularly significant. It lost the seat by a whopping 15,000 votes. The defeat had set off alarm bells and that had probably set the coup plan in motion. One name that emerged as a potential mastermind of the downfall of Pakatan Harapan was former Economic Affairs Minister, Mr. Azmin Ali, known in many circles as Dr. Mahathir's blue-eyed boy. He was seen to have opposed the idea of transferring power from Dr. Mahathir to Anwar after the APEC meeting at the end of the year as agreed upon at the PKR's Presidential Council meeting on 21st February. 
In fact, Asmin had wanted Dr. Mahathir to stay on as Prime Minister until the end of his term. Uh, Asmin seems to take a line that he wanted Mahathir to stay on in power. And this is against uh, what has been discussed earlier uh, in Pakatan Harapan and more so in, in PKR that, um, that Mahathir will have to hand over someday uh, the leadership to Anwar Ibrahim. So, Azmin Ali is basically saying that Mahathir should stay on till the end of the term, which is against the so-called uh, uh, consensus. Analysts believe that the relationship between Azmin and Anwar had reached a point of no return. And that's the reason why Azmin was willing to go for broke. But I think the most important moment in this relationship is late last year when there were sex tapes released where allegedly Azmin was present. And um, Anwar's public position was that this was a matter that should be investigated and should Azmin be declared or found to be guilty, he should resign. And this was something that Azmin took very personally because from his perspective, he was someone that had supported Anwar against these very same accusations on two occasions, and he never questioned him, and he supported him. So I think very much at that point, he felt that he had no future in PKR. But former cabinet minister Sharir Abdul Samad believed that they're all in it together, including Dr. Mahathir, insisting that the key objective of Dr. Mahathir then was to prevent Anwar Ibrahim from becoming prime minister. I think it's uh, all of them, the whole group. I believe that Mahathir would be in the know. It's impossible for Mahathir not to be in the know. From the very moment he accepted Amno defectus, defectus, right, into Bersatu, and asked for Amno MPs to join Bersatu, leave Amno, join Bersatu to strengthen him, so that he will can stand up to Anwar. And so the whole thing comes around to, you know, the real motivation. It's not about who pulled it or who decided or initiated it, but I think the real motivation, I think, was just to not to have Anwar as Prime Minister. Lah. You know, that was the real motivation. Amno, Anwar cannot be the Prime Minister. And this probably was the consensus of all those around Mahathir. Mahathir was completely uh, aware of all this. And he, I would say that he's, he's uh, complicit, you see, to the plan. Yeah, so I don't think he can wash his hands off it, uh, which is strange because now, as though, you know, he's being put up there to save the country when he is the one, you see, responsible for it. I mean, you're the leader. And, and that's why my theory is that his faculties are not very sound anymore because if you're a leader, you should know. You should be able to make a decisive decision and say, no, you shouldn't do it. But obviously, you see, his uh, words or whatever you know, decision he made didn't seem to come true. And they went ahead with the plan during that evening. The plan to form the new coalition involving Bursatu, Amno, Bas, and some defectors from PKR, however, failed to materialize after Dr. Mahathir quit in protest of the move to accept Amno leaders on block, especially those who are on trial for corruption. He also refused plans by Amno and PAS to ditch the AP from the new coalition, Perikatan Nasional. Sebaliknya, Zahid nak masuk dalam kerajaan campuran ini on block sebagai Amno. Ini saya tak dapat terima. Saya tak boleh kerjasama dengan Amno on block. Amno punya ahli. Ada yang innocent, yang tak salah. Tetapi ada juga yang sedang menghadapi perbicaraan dalam mahkamah. Dr. Mahathir, who was reappointed as an interim prime minister, however, suffered a blow after the king rejected his call for a vote in parliament to elect a new leader. The king insisted that it is he who will decide on the next prime minister who gets the majority support from lawmakers from the various political parties and not parliament. Bursatu then decided to drop Dr. Mahathir as candidate for prime minister and named Mr. Muhyiddin. Perhaps the plan for this coup has already taken place. Yeah? 
uh, and uh, perhaps they were trying to convince Tun to actually be part of this coup. And when he didn't, I guess um, the Bersatu members um, abandoned him and what Tun said betrayed him uh, and they went ahead with this uh, plot. Barisan National Opposition Coalition and Pan-Malaysian Islamic Party and 10 PKR defectors led by Azmin Ali also did the same. In all, Mr Muhyiddin enjoyed the support of 96 MPs in the 222-member parliament, while Anwar Ibrahim from Pakatan Harapan secured the endorsement from 92 MPs. With the support of East Malaysian parties, Mr Muhyiddin is believed to have won sufficient numbers to form the government. The plan to topple Pakatan Harapan government from power succeeded at the end. The only difference is Dr Mahathir is now no longer in charge. I think the, the downfall was a consequence of several actions for a variety of reasons. But it coalesced to the point where as Mayuddin and, uh, and Azmin very cleverly took advantage of. And I think that's also not illegal. <laughs> when there's a power vacuum, you think you fill it up. Dr. Mahathir believes that he has the support of the majority of the lawmakers instead of Muhyiddin, with at least 114 MPs backing him. He also reiterated that a no-confidence motion could be filed against Mr. Muhyiddin at the next parliamentary sitting in May to prove his point. Well, I mean, that is his position. You know, Dr. Mahathir has come out publicly to say that he feel, felt betrayed by uh, Muhyiddin. And I think, uh, you know, this stems from the fact that he himself, you know, wanted to remain Prime Minister uh, and Mohidin had somehow sneaked behind him to take over that position by working with or co-opting uh, AMNO and PAS as a bloc. While the horse trading and the political jockeying for power continue ahead of the May parliamentary session in the minds of the general public now, Mr Mohidin Yassin is their Prime Minister. Dengarlah baik-baik. Saya bukanlah pengkhianat. But who really is Mr. Muhyiddin Yassin? Will he be the man who can bring stability back to the country after weeks of political turmoil? Or will he be staring at a long and bumpy road ahead? Saya tampil untuk menyelamatkan keadaan apabila kedua-dua calon Perdana Menteri tidak mendapat sokongan majoriti ahli-ahli Dewan Rakyat. He was never considered a front runner in the battle for the premiership. To many observers, the race for the nation's top job had always been between two key political figures, Dr Mahathir Mohamad and his protege turned political nemesis and ally. Anwar Ibrahim. But the rise of Mr. Muhyiddin Yassin to the pinnacle of power in Malaysia had raised suspicion about his role in the plot to topple the government of Pakatan Harapan. When Dr. Mahathir hesitated to accept UMNO leaders who are in trial for corruption, coupled with his unwillingness to break ranks with DAP, Mr. Muhyiddin sprang into action. He came out openly against Dr. Mahathir and later pulled Bursatu out of the ruling coalition. Dr. Mahathir was then put on the spot. I'm sure he's under tremendous pressure and I don't think he's thinking straight. Um, which I, I mean, I don't blame him because there's so much pressure, there's so much uh, crisis that is unresolved, you know, by the minute. Uh, and, and, and the capacity to think long term, I think, is probably not there. Dr. Mahathir took a drastic and unexpected decision he resigned from his post of Prime Minister and Bursatu Chairman, and that led to the collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government. I really don't understand why he needs to resign, because if he wants to actually strengthen Pakatan Harapan, um, then it should move from there. 
I'm, I'm not sure even now what, what was the reason for him to actually resign. The question is, was it right for Mr Muhyiddin to go against the party chairman and join hands with the then opposition parties UMNO and the Islamic party PAS? What is the right thing in politics? I mean, <laughs> so long as it's permissible in law, so long as it's not criminal conduct, it's par for the cause. And that's what power grab, power play is about. I'm not condoning or I'm not supporting it, but I'm just saying, morally may be repugnant and maybe the voters will one day punish them. Possible. But they did no wrong under the law. So, so I think one has to live with this game. Not, this is not the, la the first and the last. <laughs> you know, it will continue. When Tun Mahathir resigned, I immediately uh, felt that this was part of the of the of a plan, you know, that all of them were doing it in a coordinated way. Uh, Azim Nali is known to be close to, to Dr. Mahade, and uh, and of course uh, Besatu was to Mahade's party. So it must be something that was already decided and already coordinated, right? Um, but what happened eventually is seems to suggest that. Uh, some people may have, particularly Tun Mahathir, may have decided to uh, do a U-turn and uh, decided not to be part of the, of the, of the scheme. Well, Dr Mahathir has come out publicly to say that he feel, felt betrayed by uh, Mohyuddin. And I think uh, you know, this stems from the fact that he himself you know, wanted to remain Prime Minister uh, and Mohyuddin had somehow sneaked behind him to take over that position by working with or co-opting uh, AMNO and PAS. By doing that, Mr Muhyiddin was able to beat Anwar to succeed Dr Mahathir through a new coalition made up of, among others, Bersatu and its former political rivals, AMNO and PAS, known as Brikatan Nasional or National Alliance. Seventy-two-year-old Muhyiddin Yassin was born in 1947 to a devout Muslim family in Johor. Armed with a bachelor's degree in economics and Malay studies from the University of Malaya, he started his career in the civil service before joining politics in 1971. An old hand in politics, Mr Muhyiddin had a string of cabinet positions in Najib Razak and Abdullah Badawi's governments, namely Minister of Home Affairs, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Education, Agriculture, Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, Trade and Industry, as well as Youth and Sports. He has been in politics for over 40 years. So he has an old hand in politics and was Chief Minister of Johor prior to this. And so I would think that you know, he has deep experience in administration and also public policy. In 2009, Mr Muhyiddin was named Deputy Prime Minister during the premiership of Mr Najib Razak. His alliance with Najib, however, ended in July 2015 when he was removed from the cabinet by Mr Najib due to his vocal opposition to the then Prime Minister's handling of the scandal marred One Malaysia Development or One MDB Fund. In February 2016, he was sacked from UMNO. And now, just four years later, he forged a deal with the very party that kicked him out to become the Prime Minister of a new coalition, Prikata Nacional. He's quite taciturn, he's quiet, you know, but he's quite an intelligent man, and I'm sure he will do a good job of it because he has proven himself as, as administrator, you know. So I think, uh, aside from the way he got to power, <laughs> I think he would do a good job. Uh, my only concern is, uh, whether his allies uh, will give him enough time to do the good things. Because if he's not able to control them, then we might go back to the old ways of abuse and, ex you know, and of, 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 of power being used for the benefit of certain people, certain groups. We might go back to pre-2018. He brings his advantage because of his, you know, uh, Malay first persona. You know, so uh, he basically will be able to overcome, 
the unease, particularly amongst the civil service, in working in a more multiracial, multi-ethnic uh, government. So it's almost back to uh, what they're used to, uh, one presumes. So he brings that uh, element of the conservatism as well as the Malay-centric policies and appearance uh, that was you know, dominant in, in Malaysia uh, prior to the emergence of the Pakatan Harapan government. That position is almost similar to the political struggle of the other right-leaning Malay-based parties in the new coalition, such as AMNO and PAS. AMNO, which led the ruling coalition for over six decades until its defeat in 2018, has always pandered to the Malay nationalist sentiments. PAS, which rules two smaller Malaysian states of Kelantan and Trunganu, on the other hand, has been pushing for a wider adoption of Islamic laws. Former UMNO minister Sharir Abdul Samad understands fully the problems that the new coalition might face in the future. For now, he regards the coming together of the three dominant parties in the coalition as nothing more than a marriage of convenience. In my mind as well, and a lot of people's minds, is, uh, is this going to be a contract marriage, you know, which means just for the convenience till the next election, or is it going to carry on? I don't know. You're putting Mahathir out and Anwar out, Lim Guan Ng out. I mean, it's a great package deal as far as, an, as, an, as for me as an AMNO leader, you know, it's a great package deal. But uh, whether we take the next step forward with uh, working together with Bersatu in the uh, next general elections is, a, is another question that you have to wait for another day. Yeah, the government will decidedly have a very, very Malay characteristic, you know. Uh, uh, I think, you know, certainly I think, uh, you know, the Malay confidence in government would be rekindled. You know, people will think that, okay, they're back in charge uh, and that the DAP guys are already out there. Muhyiddin, however, knows that in his desire to appease the Malay grounds, he can't afford to alienate non-Malay constituents. Yet, there are still fears among many Malaysians about where exactly the government is going. Many of them, who had voted for Pakatan Harapan, had hoped that their victory would help usher in the creation of a new Malaysia, or Malaysia Baru. And now, under a new government, they feel that Malaysia would revert to the old ways and bring the Malay agenda back to the forefront of the country's political life. This construct of, of, of Malay supremacy will always remain as long as our education system is flawed, as long as our social, cultural, social communication systems are flawed, as long as we are constantly segregated into religious beliefs and thoughts, so on and so forth. You know? And I think that's not something um, that one government in one five-year cycle uh, can change. I hope that, you know, that this new um, coalition will not um, even perpetuate uh, racist and also uh, extremist religious uh, uh, policies because that will, will not actually gel well with all the Malaysians. Will the fears of voters who voted for Pakatan Harapan in the last general election come true? Will they see the end of the new Malaysia dream? On 9th March 2020, just a week after he was sworn in as Malaysia's new Prime Minister, Mr Muhyiddin Yassin unveiled his first cabinet. As widely expected, he has given both Bursatu and AMNO a dominant role in the new Perikatan Nasional. Bursatu leads the pack with 11 ministers. Among them are Azmin Ali, Mohammad Radzi Jidin, Saifuddin Abdullah and Zuraida Kamaruddin. AMNO follows closely with nine ministers. They include, among others, Ismail Sabri Yaakob, Hishamuddin Hussein, Kairi Jamaluddin, Hamza Zainuddin, Rizal Merikan, Naina Merikan, and Adam Baba. 
I think we can understand uh, for AMNO is because it's now the largest bloc uh, in the government and hence in order to reward support uh, from uh, the political party and hence we see uh, a huge number of cabinet positions uh, being given to uh, AMNO. For Bersatu, it's understandable because it's the party of the so-called Prime Minister and, and the Prime Minister needs to have that backing of his own party uh, in the government and hence we see that balance between AMNO and Bersatu. At the moment, smaller parties such as MCA and MIC have one minister each and that's partly because of their low representations in parliament. MCA won only one parliamentary seat in the last general election while MIC secured two. What's missing in the cabinet lineup is the hotly contested deputy prime minister position. It has now been left vacant. I think that he wants, this is the PM, to make a clean break with the tensions within Pakatan Harapan over the past. He's younger, he's 72, 73, uh, so he doesn't need to face this immediate question of a successor. By not having this position filled, he is precluding the emergence and the consolidation of a potential rival. Mr. Mohidin has also left out UMNO leaders who are currently on trial for graft. And they include party president Ahmad Zahid Amidi and secretary general of the party Tunku Adnan Mansour. Mohidin comes in and says that this coalition is mainly to, to preserve Malay identity and Islam identity, and, uh, which was what Pakatan has failed. And that's why he brought Basatu out. So that was the narrative that we are given. But on the other hand, he also wants to respond yeah, to the criticisms that uh, he's able to work with anybody uh, for political expediency. And hence, he's trying to say that, no, that's not the case. I want to retain Malay identity. I want to retain Malay rights and Islam. But at the same time, I also want a clean government. And hence, I will not work with those who still have ongoing court cases. A powerful finance minister position, historically reserved for a senior figure in the ruling government, however, has been given to a non-politician, CIMB Group CEO Tengku Zafru Tengku Aziz. Other parties from Sabah and Sarawak are also well represented. They now have five ministers in the cabinet. The Islamic Party PAS, which has 18 MPs in the coalition, is represented by three ministers, including Tuan Ibrahim Tuan Man and Takiyuddin Hassan. They would have had their eye on, you know, the minister or ministry for religious affairs. They did not get that. Nonetheless, they got the deputy ministerial position, as well as the ministerial position for law and parliamentary affairs. When you look at the long sweep of PAS, this is the most influential that they have been at the federal level. And also, we must take into account that there are people in East Malaysia that would be very much against them having too big a role. So were they to be given too many positions, the coalition could have also fallen apart. Although Mr. Muhyiddin has removed the number two role in the cabinet, he has created four coordinating minister posts. Among those appointed to the senior minister positions are Azmin Ali from Bursatu, Fadilah Yusuf from Sarawak's GPS. He's now the infrastructure development minister. Ismail Sabri from AMNO, and Radzi Jidin from Bursatu, who now assumes the senior minister of education portfolio. As the new government gets down to business of governing, the biggest loser in the entire power play is none other than 72-year-old former Deputy Premier Anwar Ibrahim. He had come very close to the throne, only to be denied of the opportunity. Not once, but twice. In 1998, Anwar, who was then the Deputy Prime Minister, was stripped of his positions in the government and sacked from the party following a fallout with Dr. Mahathir Mohamad. He slipped again this time due to the sudden collapse of the Pakatan Harapan government. Will he ever get a chance to be the next Prime Minister of Malaysia? It's quite painful to see it happening, where Anwar's uh, premiership is actually denied again and that the retirement of Tun is also denied 
as well. Yeah, because uh, what the agreement on the 21st of uh, February was something that gives some stability to me. Yeah, uh, in terms of the issue of transition, and in terms of who is the next uh, uh, prime minister. So now it's back to the drawing board again. I think still Anwar Ibrahim will still be the prime minister in waiting. Uh, the biggest winner, I suppose, will be Tan Sri Mahyudin. He's finally become a Prime Minister. The question is, what will happen to the reform agenda that Pakatan Harapan government have promised to the people who voted for them in the last election? Will the collapse of the government on March 24, 2020 signal the end of the new Malaysia dream? No, it just hasn't arrived yet. It hasn't arrived, so it depends on what you mean by the concept Malaysia Baru, right? It's new in the sense that yes, there was a turnover of government, but if you want the Malaysia Baru to be like a very substantive kind of reforms or revitalization, yes, obviously it has not happened yet. I think Malaysia Baru um, will still survive. Uh, we have this is a big setback, yes, I do agree, but um, the principles of why we want a new Malaysia and why people gave us the mandate on 9th of May is because they want a change. Um, yeah? They want to get rid of uh, abuse of power, corruption, they want reform. So that was the mandate and um, Malaysia Baru will continue with that mandate. That mandate, however, could no longer be enforced after the fall of Pakatan Harapan government. The reality is, ethnicity remains a big factor in Malaysian politics. To survive politically, the government of the day has to win over the support of the majority community in the country. And that would be the Malays, who form 60% of the population. For political parties that represent the interests of the minorities, uh, they have to work with parties that have strong representation in the Malay community. By resigning from his post, Dr. Mahathir had lost a distinct advantage over his potential challengers. The vacancy had opened up fresh opportunities for rival political parties to rise up and reassert their claim for the top job. And that had put him in a very vulnerable position, even as he attempted to ward off the challenge and hang on precariously to power. Will this be the end of the road for Dr. Mahathir? It's not the end of Dr. Mahathir. And he's regarded as a statesman in Malaysia. I don't think he wants to end history at this point of time where he's seen at his, to be at his lowest. I think he, he might be thinking on how he can save this Malaysia. Dr. Mahathir will continue to remain a vocal critic of any government, particularly one where he is not leading. Uh, so we expect him to continue to play a strong vocal role uh, in terms of what is going on and given the bitterness that has already been displayed uh, I think there is likely going to be a very very frequent <laughs> and sharp criticism coming from him he may or may not lead the next round of political mobilization but certainly he will lend his voice in its support the question is will he succeed Dr. Mahathir has deflected every single challenge to his leadership and emerged victorious. He even successfully brought down two prime ministers even after he was no longer in power. But the truth is, Dr. Mahathir has been outplayed and outmaneuvered by his own close colleagues and allies at last. It's truly a bitter pill for him to swallow. But in spite of the setback and disappointment, it remains unthinkable for the combative Dr. Mahathir to walk away and disappear into the night. But for now, the people of Malaysia are pinning their hopes on Mr. Muhyiddin Yassin and his new Perikatan National Government to bring stability back to the country amid the tough economic environment and steer the nation forward. Mm -hmm.